Let's do it. Kathy. Kim. Crew. Thanks for including me. I'm humbled, honored, and terrified. <laughs> Beyond that, that's pretty much all I've got. I guess we can just go straight to questions if you want to. <laughs> did you hear just before the break, did you pick it up or was I the only one? When Kim said, great job, Steve. Wow, you really covered all the bases. That's, uh, we got one more talk and that's pretty much it. <laughs> Excuse me, I've only worried about this for about 10 months, and you had to start me off that way. Thank you. Can't hear you. Who said something? So here we are. It is time for winter. In some ways, I'm highly qualified because I am innately so unqualified to talk to you about winter. This is what remains of my Alabama accent after being in Ohio for 35 years or so. How many Ohioans are here? <sighs> Why would you come to this? You've heard all my stories. <laughs> well, sit through this one because it's kind of appropriate. When I was newish from leaving the Deep South and going to Maryland and other places first, I got this job at Ohio State down the road here, 25 miles, agricultural research campus for those who don't live here. And I was, a, at the time, a teacher, instructor, part apiarist, part extension specialist, whatever. And so I was asked to bring three, three beehives in early winter to a bee meeting in Ashland, Ohio, which is 35 miles away. So I went over on a heavy frosted morning with my recent southern attitude still totally intact and I picked up three decent hives with the help of student labor that I had, put those hives on an open trailer and stuffed the entrance with grass, lashed them down with the rope because those ratchet straps had not been invented <laughs> and off we did go to this bee meeting in Ashland, Ohio, about 36 miles away. And I fretted the whole way because those bees are going to freeze. Certainly, I would freeze back there. <laughs> Any animal with good sense is going to freeze to death at 34 degrees, rotting in an open trailer. So we got to this meeting site, Ashland University, and we set them off somewhere. I hope I'd never see the place again. And you know that move you make? If you're not one of the commercial guys, you're just the rest of us, the 95%, well, you go up, okay, they're gonna kill me here, possibly, so I'll snatch out that entrance screen, that grass, and give them room. I snatched out the first plug, and absolutely nothing happened. It must be clustered really tight. I was expecting that, that is a cold ride. But somewhere in the back, back side of your brain is kind of a question mark that's unaddressed. So you open the second one, exactly the same thing, and by now the question mark has moved to the forefront. This doesn't feel right. This feels funny. So I opened the third one with the people standing around, just a few who had helped me unload. Not a thing in the world. You just kick the top of that outer cover off and look inside, and those bees, 34 degrees Fahrenheit, 35 mile drive outside on an open trailer had overheated and suffocated. And this part of the story has been fixed so that it reads right. The language has been cleaned up appropriately <laughs> because in my mind, as I've reviewed this now way too many times, as you look across, the Ohio State beekeepers were coming across the campus quad like zombies staggering my way, gear on, to have an open hive demonstration. <laughs> okay, I pose this to you. You've got from a pretty much over here catty corner across the street to right here to come up with a plan on how you're going to do something with these bees for the Ohio State Beekeepers 1980 
organization. What you gonna do? What you gonna do? Run. Run. <laughs> I could have done that. I was a runner then. I conferred with my extension specialist standing beside me, and we agreed to give an in-depth discussion on winter kill bees. <laughs> And a novice beekeeper is a novice beekeeper no matter what decade. But the older beekeepers, they look at that, and they look at you, and they look back at that, and they think, oh, just be quiet. Just let us get through this. <laughs> so that was somewhat of the initiation of me giving up the southern way of doing things. I put all my baby nukes in the shade. That resulted in basically all my baby nukes dying because it didn't really warm up until what? The middle of August, it seemed like to me. <laughs> so that was wrong. I thought that you could go tip colonies as I'd done all my life in Alabama and North Florida. You can just tip colonies from the back and you can get an idea, only an idea, of how heavy those colonies are. Well, I tip, not bad, tip, broke, not bad, tip, not bad. I didn't know that colonies would actually freeze down in Ohio, so basically all those beehives died from starvation in the winter, but I decreed them to be all right, everybody there in listening distance. So if I have gained any credentials for giving a talk, I have gone through a harsh transition in trying to get through this. If you think that any aspect of what I'm going to say today may have in a moment of weakness some future interest to you, there's an address to my PDF of this presentation that's going to follow. It's going to be in depth, it's going to be informative, it's going to be stimulating, and it's going to be mostly fantasy. <laughs> so you describe how, you decide how much of this that you want to try. You got it? You got it? Anybody, let me go the other way. If you don't have it, hands up. Let's go. All right, it's complicated because we're not going to do it the same way. I have broken this thing down because in this room are people from the, from the deep southern states and in this room are people from upstate New York. And my job here for an hour or half or so is to somehow make us all fit in the same size. So I've divided this thing up into three categories, the first being the most painful, the way the bees do it as much as they can on their own. Because what I'd like to think is that our wintering biology and behavior would have that as a foundation, no matter if you do have most of the beehives in the world. It's still going to work basically the same way with the bees' requirements and demands and expectations. So the natural way, the enthusiast way, and the commercial way. And it's going to vary. This kind of comes across weird, but I'm actually serious. Bees are really designed nicely to die. So I want to tell you straight up, if you ever think in my lifetime, and probably in yours, that there's going to be a time when all our bees just live forever in perpetuity, when you said that about those Monsanto crops, planting corn that lasts forever, and I guess cotton, cotton's a perennial plant anyway, we just cut it down and replant it. Maybe this would happen sometime with the bees. Well, that's going to change the whole scope. But nonetheless, drones die. Bees die after stinging. Bees drowned. I have got enough of that information to bore you to tears. Starvation, they'll cannibalize. They will whimsically go in and eat their young, which just endears you to bees and makes you understand. <laughs> Let's go have some of our young upstairs. We got them stored. <laughs> they will shamelessly rob each other and kill them without any apparent bee thought whatsoever. And then colonies just die in the winter out here in the tree. I mean, they've always died that way. So keep this in mind, that bees only live a brief time anyway. And in the natural bee world that I'll discuss here in a few minutes, in their own way, they have accounted for that. We're the ones who want them to live in perpetuity and be prepared to hear that again. So some bees are going to die somewhere all the time. As this season starts right now, they're going to go through this transition. 
Uh, Kim said you're all advanced, you're all upper level, keep this thing chock-a-block above the normal. But if you were abnormal, I would tell you that you gotta have strong colonies and you gotta go into winter if you know healthy bees and all that kind of thing. But as this transition occurs, it, re it remains to be remarkably sophisticated as this goes from this wintering cluster, these bees inside this situation here, frosted over, actually in pretty good shape because they're being insulated by the snow there. So that's kind of a quiescent period. And we like to say that this is kind of a quiet time in beekeeping. Well, that's easy for you to say because you're inside in the strato lounger with one or two heating systems going, watching old reruns of Laverne and Shirley. They're outside in the hive generating heat like crazy, so they would probably argue with you that it's not exactly a relaxed, laid back, let's take a break kind of season. They're working chock-a-block nonstop all the way through. So they have to go through this transition from foraging outside. I've been told, I have read, that that basic cluster there has contracted itself from the approximate 18,800 acres that that colony would have foraged over and compressed itself into this mass of bees right here. And if suddenly the day was upon them and the weather was where it would be, they would spring back into motion and stretch back out to their normal, everyday living procedure when the weather is great. So this transition has to occur where somebody whistles, calls them in. Well, I have bad weather tonight, so it on TV inside the hive here, so everybody come back home, let's get on with this and batten down. So they go through this process of changing over. Everybody's gotta give numbers. I think that these are important. The brood nest requirement's going to be 90 to 97 degrees. Now, while I said my southern heritage had become somewhat watered and dated, I still marvel. Still, Pete, where can I stand? <laughs> Everybody's doing the head jerk. I still marvel when I see these bees frozen over, even in the first picture, even later this week probably in Ohio, when it really gets down cold, that inside, if there's a brood nest there, those bees are able to maintain that, or have to maintain that, as high as 97 degrees. I thought it's more often 96, but there it is. Their thorax flight temperature has to be at 81 degrees for them to take flight. Seeley has either implied, said, or danced around, or alternatively, I have misread Seeley, that when the swarm breaks up, and begins to fly and circle and fly and circle for a while, what those guys are doing is coordinating, getting their engine temperature up to flight speed before they suddenly zip off at 22 miles an hour. And that they probably would not go straight from there to there without this flight period, warm up period. The max they can tolerate is 111. That Temperature across insectum seems to be fairly stable because they'll actually use a degree or two or three difference at various times, like when they're bawling a queen. Well, they're not actually stinging her to death or killing her, they could be some of that, but in general, all they're doing is clustering around her and they're killing her by overheating her because she can't take the heat. So the bees that are right up next to her they're just a degree or two themselves from going to the hive in the sky. So they have other occasions too on those Japanese hornets. If that story is true, what a great story that is, where they lure and let in, come, come on, come on in here, yeah, you're welcome, and let the, the scout Japanese hornets come in, and then they attack that thing and do this cluster around it and kill the scout, so the scout never gets back with the information about where this hive is located. That's not my story, not my data, but I would like it to be true because it's such a clever story. They shiver at 64. What does that mean, I wonder? They don't really shiver like we do, where your little hair stands up and that kind of thing. <coughs> but they must do that wing vibration quiver thing. 
I was told in my mind, it seemed like it was on a Cracker Jack box, <laughs> that bees sting movement. And so as a kid, we had a big magnolia that fell across the small creek. And so my friend and I crawled up through that root system, watching for snakes, <coughs> crawled up on that magnolia, sat on the creek down below, water flowing, took this can of sardines out of our pocket, and the RC Cola in a bottle and sat there and ate a can of sardines and drank an RC. Picnic's over, time to go. As we look back through that root structure, there were yellow jackets flying everywhere that we had disturbed getting up. Well, you can't go that way because it's a tree that just gets higher and higher and there's a creek down there. We gotta go back through this, but I reassured my friend that these insects sting movement. And I convinced him of it. <laughs> we went through those yellow, ja yellow jacket swarm and they ate us alive. <laughs> and yet, in the middle of all that, he still took time while we were on the ground rolling and screaming and crying to tell me what a dummy I was. <laughs> for convincing us to go through an obvious danger source. We should have dropped 15 feet into the creek or anything other than that. When I would lie in the barn and toss rocks just to harass wasps, they would do that thing. I don't know what that was doing because at the time I was fully aware that bees didn't sting movement. And that's that kind of thing they're doing where they bring using their flight muscles to bring it up to, to flight temperature. They're very small, of course, and so they have very quick responses to this insect, uh, to this temperature increase, to this temperature decline. So they respond fairly quickly. I have all this morass of numbers here because science is frequently a morass. One paper said that 43 is when they go into a chill coma. Another paper said that the chill coma range is more like 48 to 52, so I gave you the whole thing. There could be some variation on the age of the bee, how well the bee was fed, the health of the bee, all kind of possible reasons that could give a range there. But at that point, they're a bit like a Chevrolet stuck in a snowbank in a blizzard. As long as they have gas in the tank of that car and you don't asphyxiate yourself, you can keep the car warm enough that you can sit there and worry. When the car runs out of fuel, then at that point you really begin to worry. So these bees at this temperature are somewhat like that. If you bring them back up, breathe on them, you can resurrect them fairly quickly. They're very appreciative. They say thank you in their own bee way, and if they don't sting you, they'll leave and fly back out to the cold where they'll certainly die. But nonetheless about that, that's just the idea that these bees are going to die pretty much at that temperature if they stay there. 64, the word goes out. I have not a clue how the word goes out. That it's time for us to be herding ourselves back into the general center of the colony. And then at 57, the classic temperature that we all quote on tests and books and everywhere else, they are all one happy family bunched back up into this cluster formation. Then at that point, Cluster temperatures take over, so at 64, they've clustered and regathered back together. That's not really very cold, is it? Even you folks from the south, 64 is not really a killer temperature, but if you're a bee and 43 is a death zone, uh, I guess that makes a bit of difference to them. 57, it's clearly formed. At 14 degrees, the cluster will be as tight as it can be. At 64 degrees down to 14 degrees, there's a five time cluster contraction. It went from this to this. So it really has tightened up and that tightening process is kind of easy to see. Let's just speculate that there's an amazing refrigeration unit in this room and that editor Kim, who's not listening to a word I'm saying, but that's all right, he's heard this talk several times has cut the temperature to minus 40 degrees in this room. Well, I'd say in about an hour and a half, our friendship is going to really be getting better 
and we're going to be getting to know each other better. And after a t couple of three or four hours, just in shirt sleeve temperature at minus 40, we're going to be real good friends right here in the middle of the room. And that basically is what the bees are doing, is they're clustering as tightly as they can. I can't think when I'm going to say this, I'll say it now, and I may have it on a slide later on, but at 14, that's roughly equivalent to the insulatory effects of bird feathers or animal fur, that the bees are able to control the heat of that cluster at that point. Then, still having requirements and needs, they'll put how the bees in the center do running in place, isometric isotomics. They'll use micro vibrations of their flight muscles. It's similar to say if they run in place and they'll generate heat. And then that heat furnace inside is what produces the heat that keeps the cluster basically warm. Now apparently those mantle bees, the ones on the outside, boy, they get short shrift because they don't generate heat be a dead loss from an economic standpoint. So if the bees on the outer surface of the cluster are cranking out heat, it's lost immediately. What a waste. So those bees live in a tough world. I've been told two things happen. That that outer band of, of bees that circle the cluster would be the older forager bees that are remaining, that when the world compressed, they knew their place, and they did not move into the nursery where the younger nurse bees were. But more often than not now, I don't read that anymore, and what I do read is those mantle bees, when they really get chilled down to that 40 degree mark and their little abdominal butts are really cold, then they'll squeeze down inside that cluster center, sit by the fire for a while, get the latest gossip, and then they'll be replaced and squeezed back out. It seems like a tiresome winter to me but that's what they're doing day in, day out in these areas, probably from Louisville, Kentucky, right up into Canada, where they sit there and run this heating unit. And I was like a kid. I ended up with the stethoscope. I think you know about it, I told you. And I took the stethoscope out in the dead of winter on snow, crunch, 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 cold, wind blowing, stuck that stethoscope to the side of the hive and it sounded like an air handler running in there, just a low, steady hum. Well, I'm like a second grade kid with a school project. This is, this is just fascinatingly great because you could walk down the hives and when you get to one that does this, when you stick the stethoscope to it, that one's gone to the hive in the sky, it's done. So they run that engine and you can actually hear it running with a simple device like a common stethoscope. All right, so greater than 14 uh, flight muscle activation is going to be required to get these guys cranked off and, and begin to get back up to the temperature to fly. This minus number, it's all over the page. They can do minus 22 routinely. They can do minus 40 and boast about it. They can do minus 80 for a short time, short time being a day, two, three, so long as they have access to fuel. So this cluster thing works for them in nature, outside, where we have them living on their own. We're trying to use that inside. I, I only heard of this heater bee concept four years ago or so, five years ago. Jurgen Taus, I think is his name. Anybody give him the name of his book? What is it? Buzz about bees. The Buzz About Bees. Great book. We should contact me about giving a more sophisticated name to it, but be that as it may, <laughs> he's the one that introduced this concept to me of heater bees. You look at this frame and you think, well, she's just missed a few cells, or they died. Every one that these queens lay is not successful, so the bees come along, clean up behind them, Otherwise, a nice pattern. Now, Randy would point out there's not a speck of pollen there <coughs> except for here. So either these bees have used it all seasonally or what, but at, at the moment they were healthy bees, they just seem to have light pollen, at least light pollen on that frame. <coughs> these heater bees get in here 
in this hole, these holes in the cluster where they think they need it. How do they know they need it? I have not a clue. And inside that hole, they do their thing. Microthoracic vibrations of their flight muscles, and they give off heat enough to, in theory, warm up 70 surrounding cells around that heater hole. So if you look at that frame, these bees are generating heat that helps that go. I pulled out frames, I've got an old slide somewhere, of, and my old, my old Alabama bees, and these frames would be dead solid all the way across. So, just got academic questions, does that mean because I'm just in the South, North Florida, South Alabama, uh, they don't need these heater holes and they'll produce solid frames? Is this just a northern thing? Do they know that? I don't know. But the concept is that the bees will go in like this to produce auxiliary heat, to provide heat throughout and within the cluster there. I left that thing in there. What do you think? What do you think? Windows 10. Am I the only one dumb enough to download Windows 10 and to upgrade my Mac on the same day? <laughs> because I was over there in a dead sweat. Let me just show you how dead my sweat is. There's a computer. There's a computer over there. Here's a jump drive with the talk on it. And there's a jump drive in the bag over there with the talk on it. And it's in Dropbox because I didn't know if any of this stuff was going to work. <laughs> and then Tim had a moment because this is not 10 here, but it came up. You like 10? Everybody likes 10? If you don't like 10, hands up. You downloaded 10, hands up. You crazy? <laughs> you like it? Yeah, I can't tell much difference between I like it fine, I just can't find stuff. <laughs> so, winter bees. Did I skip a slide or something? I, I just wanted to show you that again. <laughs> And in Windows 10, it's actually called honeycomb transition. So we will all be sick of this in just about two years because you'll all be using it over and over again. Winter bees survive about 100 days. Warm season bees, my name, I don't know what to call them, regular bees? So I've called them warm season bees, survive about 30 days. Apparently, uh, Winter required additional development time after emerging. These winter bees should have been, this is the first time I've given this talk. Apparently, winter bees require additional development time after emerging. I thought that a winter bee was a genetically contrived, nutritionally derived organism. And to some extent, I'm sure it is, but they still require feeding and nurturing to get them up to full power, official winter bee. So if you have varroa mite feeding during that time, it disrupts that preparation, that blood hemolymph protein development that the bees are going to need to be sanctioned as a true winter bee. And then I'm back into the groove that Dennis was in. It's going to have an effect in late winter when that bee can't quite finish the race. Too cramped up, too back, no liver glycogen left, bummed out. Got to walk it for a while and they can't finish the run. So then they're going to die at that point. Which leaves me then in one first class quandary. Because if I had to summarize in my own way what we've discussed for the last two days here is we don't have, and I'm not being sarcastic or derogatory, we don't have a clear cut silver bullet. And what we should do is choose three I thought two would be a gracious plenty. Then it said three compounds off the litany list of ludemorg things that kill mites or at least harass mites. So then we choose your three, you get to choose, then you get to change later on. And Randy told me that you need to feed bees because outside there the world isn't what it used to be and the ecosystem is not necessarily diverse enough to carry the population so feed your bees something, we're just not sure what, you decide. And lastly, I've had all these commercial beekeepers imply, tell me that if I don't have something like 35,000 colonies, 
I can't justify calling myself a beekeeper. <laughs> I'm sorry, I say if a man's down, kick him. <laughs> oh, that is, that's true. Then the uh, commercial part's not, I'm kidding. I kid hard, but he does too. But the first two things are true, because I'm going to tell you over and over and over again, I don't have enough for everybody. I can't share. This is not the third grade. <laughs> Stuff's bad for you. Don't drink it. <laughs> that if you don't have these things ready to go like this, they're going to die in the winter. You won't go into winter healthy. So this kind of thing here is going to become important later on when we decide what we do to control these things. I had an epiphany, and I hate some epiphanies. Most are not good for me. I was sitting at my computer in my little shop, and I was, of all things, talking to somebody about doing something to their bees in Nebraska. And I had a thought, you know, I don't have any umbrella anymore. I don't work for any university on a, on a tenure faculty position. I worked for the Alabama Cooperative Extension System as a contract professor, and I thought, hmm, am I covered? Am I an insurance safety situation? So I checked into it, and of course you're not. <laughs> Anybody ever been told, no, no, you're fine. Talk to anybody you want in Nebraska. Tell them anything. We'll cover it. No. So it was uh, in Columbus. Help me out, Ohio. Big company. Tall building. Nationwide. Which one? Na nationwide has a beekeeper coverage plan. So I said, I got to have some of that. Big company, <laughs> tall building, got a beekeeper coverage plan. So I filled out the form and it said, how many times a year do you migrate with your bees? None. Uh, how much honey do you sell per year at markets and wholesale? Practically none. Uh, how often do you require truck insurance and safety? I don't require that for bees. I ended up doing none on every one of them, so I had to attach a disclaimer saying that uh, I'm a professor, retired, and I'm doing these things on kind of an exploratory, educational basis for me, just in life, having a nice time at 67. I got a response back from Nationwide saying I was not a traditional beekeeper and they couldn't cover me. So where does that leave me? <laughs> Can I contact somebody and say, okay, I'm a non-traditional beekeeper. Is that weird enough? Because I do bizarre things. I took some of these colonies and I let them die hammer dead just so I could make these pictures for you of what's going to happen to your bees if you don't pick out those three miticides and do something to harass these and these acaricides, these acaricides. So, I was surprised to see, I, you know, it's a great picture, and you gotta put it on the wall. Here's a varroa here, there's an egg there, there's a starving larvae here, because if you listened to Randy yesterday, there's not enough food around them. There's, up there's a varroa mite, there's a varroa mite inside this cell, here's a varroa mite here. These bees are dead, and yet they're still living larvae there. The thing I can't tell you is where did the few bees go that left? Do they leave one at the time? Is it kind of a forlorn, misbegotten event that they decide one by one, but they got no future here. I'm going to go out and drift some. I don't know what they're doing. I don't see them leave and you know do a cluster thing anywhere. So this then is going to be the result of extreme varroa predation on the wintering cluster, and it happens right now in August, and I saw them explain why that that would be going on that way. Now here's the deal. If you are pre-varroa beekeeper, can I see your hand? Don't be bashful, put them up there and hold them for a second. Then you remember the way it's supposed to be. And in my heart of hearts, I just can't let it go. <laughs> so what the rest of you need, who didn't put your hand up, is for all of us to go away. <laughs> because we're never gonna be able to get back to where we were, even if we suddenly could control Varroa not, uh, without any apprehension, gone, finished. 
we still don't have the full abundant ecosystem. We've still got total herbicide use and all the other changes that have gone on. So when we pine about 57, 55, 57, when we had what, five million colonies, seven million colonies in 57, one or the other, and now we got 2.4 million, what's happened to the bees? Well, I gotta quiz you. Where would you put five million colonies right now if we had them? What would you do? What would the industry do with five million colonies right now when we can barely keep our honey averages where they are now? You're like a dog chasing a car. What are you gonna do with it when you catch it? So be careful what you wish for. But I do love the old days and I really am sorry that they have to go, but this cannot keep happening. So I make the point that it was not hard to do. You just don't treat for about a season and a half and that happened.